Hello! Today's stories come from r slash malicious compliance. We've got four really fun stories today. First up, why did you schedule this call on my off hours? Been reading other stories of virtual meeting shenanigans, thought I would add my own. Day off, attending a hazard reduction burn, so out in the bush with a fire truck, suited up and running around like a happy pyromaniac. I get a phone call from work, I answer and get told I must be present for a virtual meeting scheduled for 10 minutes time for a training on a system I already know, as I had been using it for the past six months at a venue. I remind them that it is my day off and my manager speaks with the tone of, do it or you're fired. Alrighty then. First strike, manager is late to their own meeting. The meeting eventually starts and I have connected by my phone and Bluetooth earphones my camera and mic are off because of the noise. The other firefighters are having a chuckle at my expense. Then my manager insists I turn my camera and mic on, otherwise they will mark me as absent. Alrighty then. I stand in a spot where the fire will roar up behind me, somewhat safely, and turn my phone camera and mic on. The rest of the firefighters go nuts with the radio chatter as the people in the virtual meeting see yours truly masked up, full ensemble with the noise of fire roaring up behind him, the sound of the pump, and the panicking radio chatter. I then end the call. Manager then begins to frantically ring as she thinks she has just seen one of her better team members go up in flames. They never scheduled training on my days off after that. Jump ship to a competitor two months later. (laughs) It's a short one, but my goodness, is that imagery ever satisfying. Remember the story of the university student turning the camera off during chemo? This is right up there, a firefighter coming on screen all masked up with a raging inferno behind him and screaming on the radio. (laughs) This story well outclasses its length. There were some gold in the comments. By Camperito said, attend the meeting or get fired? I'll show you fired. Hot Lava Tube said, when you said you'd fire me, I didn't think you meant this. Ah, it burns. Call disconnected. The letter K shared, My husband was injured at work, and they kept telling him he needed to talk with the insurance and lawyer people about the incident. He told them to let him know when they get here, speaking at work. They looked confused and told him, no, you have to call them after work because it will take a few hours to sort everything out. So we asked what service he uses to submit the overtime required for that. They laughed and said they weren't going to pay him for talking on the phone. Well, he said, then they can call me on the clock or come here in person. When I'm off work, I have non-work-related stuff to do. I don't have hours to spend covering your butts. 818 said, Sometimes, people just need to accept that I can't right now is legitimate. I received one of those calls from a manager when they didn't accept that I was calling in sick because I was in the hospital. I had a nurse take a picture of me mid-appendectomy, and I sent that to them during recovery. I was left alone for the entire four weeks off for recovery. Our second story is a bit rough with all the pop culture references, but trust me, it's worth it. It's called, having a second job won't cut it with me. You better fix that pronto. You got it, dude? This pains me to write. I keep going back and forth as to which of my sentences I should start with, the former or this next one. Tears are rolling down this old teacher's face, a rarity. I've had a fairly rough teaching career. In my 16 years of contracted service, I've spent five of those in the school I've been at this year. This is a record possible in part due to my eventual awesomeness at teaching algebra. Part from learning when to shut up, always. Part learning that the students and my care are all that matters, but mostly due to my great rapport relationship with my principal. He gets my quirkiness, knows I'm a great teacher, so he doesn't need to tell me what he has to others, for the most part and he's as hands-off as an amazing principal can be. I finally hit my groove in education when my principal, we'll call him Dr. J, just got his doctorate and now is moving onward and upward. Uh Uh-oh, I'm not sure if this is just a school thing, but he's doing his farewell tour while introducing us all to the new principal. We'll call him not the mama. Anyone from the 90s who also has suffered from the new boss blues knows my pain and gets this reference. During the tour, Dr. J tells Not the Mama about me, how I'm the hardest, smartest worker and teacher, how I have a great relationship with my students, hope they stop by the school to see me years after. He also mentions in this live recommendation that I have a second job working fast food. Not the Mama instantly winces at this. 
right about the same time as everyone's favorite teacher, Miss Why Aren't You Paying Attention to My Ironic T-Shirt, pops out of a sky filled with irregular sized suspenders and stories about someone's relatives that amazingly have no relevance to any person, living or dead. I'm pretty sure she said something to distract Dr. J long enough to give not the mama the opportunity to turn back to me, like a dad threatening his children to behave while he tries to convince his first date, since his wife left him, that he's a great dad. He manages to quickly mutter under his breath what confirmed every fear I had about the new boss. Having a second job won't cut it with me, so you better fix that pronto. Reverse Jerry Maguire, you lost me at pronto and had me at heck no. I despised this person so much in such a short time that it wasn't even an afterthought that, despite my second job being minimum wage, and despite my current job just issuing me a longevity bonus, literally yesterday, I would press the biggest, most important malicious compliance button of my life and see how the heck it goes. Pronto means soon, so that afternoon I put in my notice that I won't be coming back. Hey, he wants me to only have one job, right? Voila, that's French for check this out. Your man OP started going back on school spring. Two interviews set up for tomorrow via Zoom. Oh, and I'm pretty sure there'll be a juicy update because I just received four missed calls from Dr. J and I'm going to check my email as requested by Dr. J. I can't believe I'm leaving. Pretty sure he can't either. Barely worth reading update. I read Dr. J's email. It was shorter than the texts, but both basically said he needs to meet with me to find out why I'm suddenly out. I can tell based on his wording that he suspects it's the new boss, but he'd never be accused of explicitly saying anything via email. I didn't give any reason for making the decision, and he begged me not to send anything officially to district until we talked. As we're texting back and forth right now, yes at midnight, he asked how I felt about Desert Valley, the district he's going to be director of pancakes or whatever at. I'm looking into it right now, but I'll sleep on it. Next update in 12 hours-ish. Okay. Nothing ironclad, but three schools need an academic advisor for math in Desert Valley. He says I'm a shoe in Pay scale looks promisingly better too. Update. Confirmed. Interviewing with two of the three schools for a job that pays me what I'm worth. Fingers crossed. On an unrelated note, it appears that I have people that either really like or really can stand my writing. Can't please everybody. Not gonna try. But thanks for the input. What I have noticed is that those who enjoyed it will give examples of what they liked, you know, claims, reasoning, and evidence. Very few who claim I'm a terrible writer give me specifics. I would like to know how I can improve. I swear, it's not just to call out the haters and call them uncreative copy pasta jerks. Update, edit. Regardless of whether I land the interview, I'm going to later this month at Dr. J's new district. I will be leaving this place and have had three teachers come and ask me what's up. I told them outright that I don't have a good feeling about the new principal. Word is getting around. I just replied to an email from my closest colleague about this post and what the dude said verbatim. She says that about six more teachers will walk too because they all have second jobs. The new principal, guaranteed, will probably lose the job before he gets it. I've seen this type of behavior before, and when the gossip train leaves the station, it always comes back with less passengers, and in this case, no conductor. There's only two options. Option one, this guy meets with district about the influx of feedback as negative as it was instantaneous and decides to walk. Option two, same beginning, but decides to stay and fight the good fight. The uphill battle just got a steeper incline for him. He is such a drastic change from Dr. J that it's a wonder he got the job in the first place. I'm curious how his interview went. Either way, I do feel for the kids because that's who will suffer the most in all of this. Unhappy teachers are education killers. But I can't think of all this right now. I have to get my mind right, positive, and forward thinking. Fallout boy. My current slash old school is begging for me back. Not the mama won't be principal next year. Evidently, I'm not the only one he rubbed the wrong way. Still moving forward with interviews, just now I'm in a crevice of doubt or something else overly described. Update. I interviewed for two schools, got offers from one already, from the one I didn't think I did so well at, and the other, I'm pretty sure I've got a good shot. Decided to take the first offer just to have it not looming over my head any longer. It's 12000 more per year than current, plus many bonuses tied to school performance that could extend that to a cool 20000 8 AKM bonuses possible, one per school that beats the national average. Excited to be moving on, and I'll probably still do Wendy's until I get a few new checks in the bank. It's actually less take-home work, this new academic coach job. 
I'm loving it. Okay, I understood the Jerry Maguire reference. I love that movie. And I know not the mama is from Dinosaurs, but I'm not seeing the connection or relevance. Can someone help me out here? I do understand the complaints about the writing, given the awkwardness of the references, but I love the story nonetheless. The arrogance of that principal to be off the cuff when meeting a new employee, figuratively snapping his fingers saying, don't like that, fix it. It just begs for malicious compliance. Let's read a few comments before the next story. 818 said, both of my parents were teachers and both had second or summer jobs, and we were okay financially. My father was told near the end of career by a new principal that he needed to focus on only one job, so my father retired. The new principal tried to backtrack on his suggestion, but the papers were already filed. You'll be better off not working for someone like that, that's for sure. Jory Lee replied, I don't get the whole one job thing. Does that mean you're not allowed to volunteer anywhere, have a hobby, have a family? I understand one job has to take precedence over another for scheduling purposes, but that's all. Mr. Rabinowitz summed it up with, it means I want to be able to control you. That's it. Dramoriga commented, I'm glad he's an algebra teacher and not English. Tanner 2 said, it's very Reddit-style writing. Our next story is, you want a man to help you? No problem. One will clock in soon. This happened 16 years ago. When I was about 20 years old, I was a department manager in a big box hardware store. People said I acted 25, but I didn't even look 18. As a young female, I saw my fair amount of discrimination, but the worst always came from women. This is the story of one such woman. I managed the paint department. I had three associates who worked for me. They loved me as a boss because I bought them a department radio, took the shifts they didn't want, worked Friday clothes and Saturday mid so my two younger guys could have time to have fun on Friday nights, and the older gentlemen took early Saturday mornings so they could sleep off their fun. In trade, I gave the older gentleman his ideal schedule. My team was awesome. One day, I was in the department alone, and a lady came up and asked me where she could find the five-gallon oil-based primer. I let her know that my location didn't carry the five-gallon size of that primer. She told me that we did, and said that it was shelved right there, while suggesting I was too stupid to remember. Her husband gave me an apologetic look. I let her know that another location had what she was looking for and that it was in fact in that exact location in that store. She let me know how stupid she thought I was for thinking she could mix up stores. Then, she began yelling and loudly insisting that I get a man out there to help her because she wanted someone competent and not a stupid little girl. Her husband actually tried to step in at that point, but I just smiled and let her know that a male paint associate would be clocking in any minute and that I would be happy to direct him to her as soon as he is on the clock. I smiled and waited for Joe to clock in. Joe was great and I knew he could handle this or I wouldn't have put him in this situation. But Joe was also new. He was learning things super quick but still relied on the rest of us for help. When I saw Joe walking up, I quickly said that there was a customer who needed help. I let him know that she was upset and asked him to do his best to answer her questions. Joe walked up to the lady. She said, finally, a man. She asked her question, explained where the product should be, and waited. Joe calmly let her know that he had never seen us carry five-gallon size of oil-based primer, but said he could check with the paint department manager. She was happy and loudly said she was happy to be getting some real help. Joe walked up to me and started to ask me about five-gallon oil-based primers. The lady quickly walked up and asked him what he was doing. He turned and said, This is my manager. She runs this department. The husband laughed out loud. The woman stormed off, and I bought Joe lunch. (laughs) I love how the husband knew how ridiculous she was being. I'd like to believe he knew she was about to get shut down and gave just enough room for her to sink herself. There were some really funny comments on this one. Lobster Go said, Worth buying lunch for a chance to sit and laugh about Karen. Catechus 13 said, Especially getting to laugh with her husband. What You Leave Behind said, You should have had Joe just say, I'm sorry, ma'am. Perhaps I should just deal with your husband on this matter. And now for our last story. Won't compensate me for my fence? Then compensate me a hundred times as much for my crops. The malicious compliance in this story is not mine. It's my brother-in-law's. Some of the details may be slightly off, but the overall story is true. 
My brother-in-law grows avocados in California. Several years ago, a portion of his ranch was ravaged by a wildfire, or so he thought at first. When the smoke cleared, it became obvious that the fire was caused by an electrical line that was blown over by strong winds and had landed on his fence, catching it on fire. Since he had been planning on diversifying his crops anyway, he decided he'd simply replace his fence, replant, and move on. To that end, he called up the electric company that owned the down line and asked them for about 10k in compensation to replace the fence that had been destroyed by their electrical line. They denied any and all culpability in the matter and told him that he should sue them if he didn't like it. What the electric company didn't realize was that my sister, his wife, works full-time as a corporate attorney for one of the largest utilities in California, defending against cases just like this one. At first, she was concerned that this utility was a subsidiary of her employer, in which case there would be a massive conflict of interest. Apparently, legal departments frown on their employees when their husband is suing them. Go figure. Thankfully, after some investigation, she realized that the utility in question was completely independent of her employer, and at that point, the gloves were off. My sister didn't represent her husband because she's typically on the other side of these cases, but she did advise him on everything he needed to bring to court to win his case. And she helped him find a very reputable lawyer with a solid record of winning cases like these. Not knowing what they were up against, the utility persisted in refusing to negotiate, hoping that by forcing my brother-in-law to trial, he would simply give up and go away. Spurred on by my sister's insistence that he had a solid case, he called their bluff and went to trial. As it turns out, California takes agricultural damage very seriously, and the court conducted its own independent investigation. It estimated the total damages at around $335,000, which is over 33 times as much as my brother-in-law had asked for initially. Furthermore, there is a law in California that awards triple damages in cases where agriculture is impacted. So the utility that had been unwilling to negotiate over $10,000 was now on the hook for over a million dollars in damages. When all was said and done, my brother-in-law confided to me that he would have gladly settled for the 10K in arbitration and that it would probably have taken him over a decade to even sell a million dollars worth of crops. The utility had to have their day in court, though. Ooh, one million dollars of liability for refusing a 10K settlement? Yikes! What makes this especially delicious is that they were responsible to begin with and played the typical insurance line of deny everything. That only works until you find someone who's in the right and serious about escalating it. The sad part is the money they save by doing this to everyone is probably well worth continuing this behavior, even if they lost big on this one. But for OP's brother-in-law, chef's kiss and well done. Now for some gold in the comments before we wrap up. Frenetic Platypus said, So that's what they mean when they say you can save a lot of money if you stop toasting avocados. In response, holy guacamole, that was good. Wester Tapa said, a lot of places have a policy of not selling any types of cases like that, simply to avoid having nuisance cases brought against them. Once word gets around that they never settle, most people with invalid claims just give up. OP, yes, but as my sister was telling me, if they had made the slightest effort at basic discovery, they would have realized that they were going to lose in court. Plus, California awards triple damages in agricultural cases to make it painful for industry to mess with farmers. $10,000 was hardly anything against the court costs and the chance at losing big. To this day, she doesn't understand why they didn't settle immediately. A Luck one said, PG&E, the utility mentioned here, got the state of California to bail them out after being found to have caused several of the largest wildfires in the state's history. The state allowed them to add surcharges to all the customers to pay off the lawsuits. They also gave PG&E billions to upgrade its infrastructure. So far, all that got upgraded were the corporate jets and the leadership's homes. If you've enjoyed the story and would like to hear more, consider liking, subscribing, and leaving a comment. Thanks, and bye for now.